it's about not disguising the narrative, but putting it in a nice costume, dressing it up so that people can find it more accessible, more interactable. But on the other hand, some people don't take it as seriously. It's about being able to take extremism to a logical conclusion. It's about being able to use metaphor to make more people understand something than necessarily they would have before. Hello! Today I want to talk about allegorical narratives, and by today, I mean I'm filming this just after Mary Island Finding the Air has come out. <laughs> Thank you. But I will not be posting this until after I've moved out of this flat and I know when my allegorical narrative book is coming out. My video camera is in one of one of the boxes that are currently in storage because I am in temporary accommodations. This is my mum's house. Aren't her curtains nice? Isn't this a nice chair? This is not mine. None of it's mine. It's all my mum's because we're staying with my mum until the house that we're supposed to be moving into is ready and available and all those kinds of things. So that's where I am right now. My video camera is in a box somewhere in the storage place. We've stored all of our boxes in and I have no idea where it is. So I have to film everything on my phone, but I'm just popping into this video. You didn't need to know all of that for this, but, but I'm telling you anyway. I'm just popping into this video to let you know about this thing, where I've, I've left myself a little bit of space in this video on allegorical narratives to talk about this thing. This is my upcoming novel, Welcome to Humanity. That's what that says. Um, it's by me. That's my name. There. Hopefully not reversed. That would be really awkward. I can't tell. <laughs> looking at the viewfinder. Anyway, it's about three people forging connections and building community in the face of growing intolerance and fear. Uh, if you want more information, please do check out the links to it on in the description box below. All the information you're going to be able to access right now is on my website. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen teasers and stuff for this already. Uh, there's loads of stuff over there. It's really like an exciting, it's an exciting time. But this is my allegorical narrative. This is the narrative that is an allegory. Um. <laughs> so what's an allegorical narrative? An allegorical narrative is taking a, a real life situation, plight, whatever, and putting it into a fictional setting, putting it into a fictional people, putting it into, you know, taking it, like divorcing it from its original context to talk about the specific issues in this particular problem. So, for example, uh, George Orwell's name, 1984, nope, that's the wrong one. George Orwell's Animal Farm is a prime example of this, where he explores different governmental systems via the metaphor of uh, farm animal, farm animals. <laughs> farm animal, da da da, nope, just farm animals, animals that live on a farm. Uh, <laughs> and then you have things like, the 90s and 2000s is, is it, did they start in the 90s or did they start in the 2000s? Is? I should have looked at The Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen X-Men movies, that original trilogy of X-Men movies um, that came out when I was a kid. <laughs> mm. And things like Disney's Zootopia or Zootropolis, depending on where you are in the world, it's got different names. Um, these are all examples of allegorical narratives. It's taking a real life situation, a real life thing to explore and putting it into a fictionalized setting. So Animal Farm is about systems of government on a farm. The fictionalization of course is that animals having a system of government that is much like our own. X-Men, the Patrick Stewart and <laughs> Ian McKellen X-Men movies are uh, taking, like, borrowing a lot, I would say, from the LGBT community, including actively having Bobby slash Iceman come out to his family as a mutant. Um, I do also think that, like, based on the time period and the way that it's done, there's a lot of leaning against the way the AIDS crisis was handled, and, like, Rogue, as a prime example, um, can be such a good metaphor for, for AIDS, because she, or a uh, not even AIDS necessarily, but a person who is HIV positive because she is, especially in that time period that it was made, she is deadly if she touches people. And obviously we are still working to try to make sure that AIDS isn't so much of a crisis anymore. 
and there is that natural fear surrounding the idea of being with Rogue, touching Rogue, but when she takes proper precautions she's perfectly safe to be around and that is a good metaphor again, like I said, for being HIV positive. Um, and she ends up with a boyfriend which is really nice because again it's sort of it's making that allegorical point that as long as you're taking the precautions that you can it is much safer and then Zootopolis, Zootopia Zootropolis is a good allegorical narrative for police profiling um, woo! <laughs> that one's a little bit more obvious but it is definitely a kids movie so it kind of needed to be a little more obvious um, with a predator prey dynamic instead of a race based dynamic um, or other marginalization based dynamic. Um, so the benefits of doing an allegorical narrative rather than a straightforward narrative, which is what I'm going to call the opposite of an allegorical narrative, is that, for example, a lot more people will come and see an X-Men movie than they will come and see a this is a movie about LGBT rights and how LGBT people are being treated and all of that kind of stuff. Like, a lot more people are going to come and see the X-Men than are going to come and see... <laughs> than are going to come and see... Um, LGBT rights movie, uh, because it's a sci-fi, it's a fun sci-fi action movie, like, because like the fact that it leans heavily against this metaphor doesn't necessarily mean that it's naturally going to to turn away people who who wouldn't necessarily want to watch that for whatever reason they might have we're not here to judge <laughs> um zootopia Zoot zootopia <laughs> combining words there uh, zootopia zootropolis is obviously a kids movie so it is divorced from context to make it more palatable to children and parents alike but it's also divorced from its context which means that people aren't going in expecting to see a movie about racial profiling they're going in expecting to see a movie about a bunny who wants to be a police officer it's also a little bit about sexism anyway <laughs> Animal Farm, for example, is banned a whole lot less than 1984, not just because it is less well known, which it is slightly less well known, although let's be honest, it's not an unknown piece of media. It is banned a lot less because they are talking animals, because it's animals that are the main characters, it feels less threatening to people who would want to ban a book that talks about governmental systems and more importantly, criticises them, particularly capitalism where like the plough horse is doing all the work and the pigs are eating all the food. I'll leave you with that one. Um, so great, let's all do allegorical narratives, right? Well, there are also a lot of troubles with our allegorical narratives. Some of the troubles include things like uh, upsetting the people that you're trying to, trying to talk about because they didn't know in advance that this was going to be about that. So when they come in and they start seeing like, the kind of bigotry that they face in real life played out on screen or on page, it can be quite upsetting because you're like, I was just here for a fun sci-fi romp. Um, the other problem is, the other big problem is definitely that it can be very difficult to... to... while divorcing the situation from its origins, it can be very difficult to maintain enough links that people can really clearly see what it's an allegory for. And if you go too far, it is too disconnected and people won't make that connection. There's also the potential issue that if people aren't familiar with the issue at hand, they might not be able to see what the allegory, that there is an allegory to be found at all. A lot of people didn't necessarily realise that the X-Men movies with Patrick Stewart were an allegory for LGBTQ issues because they never faced those issues themselves and even with Bobby having come out to his family and that being one of those quintessential well-known LGBT pieces of like media tropes, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to pick up on it outside of that and like I certainly, I'll admit, I just came up with a rogue 
HIV positive thing just now while I was thinking about this before I actually made this video or rather when I made the draft version of this video because I do that sometimes uh, also because certain little boys are being I'm pointing at him like you can see him he's on the sofa which is over there um, he's he's being very afraid today so there's been a lot of barking um, I don't know what he's afraid of I can't hear anything but my ears are not dog ears so I don't know anyway um, if you haven't been faced with an issue, it can be easy to miss it in an allegory. If school taught you that racism ended in the 1970s or whenever, you won't necessarily see the racism in an allegory because you believe what you were taught at school, because why wouldn't you? Um, I mean, that's less of an issue, I guess, for a lot of people these days, but at the same time, I think it still is an issue. Like, I know that when I was at school, I was taught that racism was over now. And then when people started talking about it, when I was in my like teenage, elder teenage and adult life, I was like, what? I thought we fixed this already. And I was like, no, we fixed this already. My school taught me. And I was quite resistant to the idea that, that racism wasn't over yet. And like, I know that's from a position of privilege, but shock horror, that's something that happens with everybody. Everybody has a level of privilege about something. Like, I also had no idea what being disabled was like until I met my mother-in-law who has a disability. Like, these are just the things we learn through experience. And if we never experience talking with someone who has faced these issues, if they are not an issue that we ourselves can actually face, like, I'm never going to face real racism. I got yelled at as a, a slur. I live in the UK. And when I was 16, I got a slur, a racial slur yelled at me across the street um, that's anti... Well, it was an anti-Polish slur because I, I don't know, I guess <laughs> I thought I looked Polish, which, I mean, how does one look Polish? But it is what it is. That's the closest I have ever come to facing racism. And that's when I really started being able to recognise that this wasn't a thing that was finished. It was something that that school had lied to me about, that school had misrepresented because the laws changed and that was that. And it's like, okay, well, if the laws change but the attitudes don't, it doesn't, it means something, but it doesn't mean all that much. Anyway, my point is that People can miss the point, especially if they are underexposed to the thing that you are trying to make an allegory for. Like, my novel that is going to be an allegorical narrative is supposed to be an allegory for trans issues, trans rights, and the existence of trans people. However, I am fully aware that some people are going to pick up this cyborg book and read through the whole thing and not see an allegory at all. Because I know for a fact that a lot of people are not privy to trans issues and are not aware of the reality of what it's like to be trans. And like, my perspective is particularly skewed by my own experiences and the experiences of the people around me and the experiences of the places that I have lived in. And it's also skewed by the fact that, I'll be honest, I don't get out much. <laughs> like. I don't tend to go places, even less so now that we have a dog, because I don't like to leave him for long periods of time, so like, and also because you know the pandemic happened and I'm just not really back into the let's go out and do things, because that was really fucking scary and it's not even over. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, I don't tend to get out much. That impacts the way that I view this as well and it impacts the way that I write about it. The second problem with allegorical narratives, because I've harped on about that one enough now, is people taking it too far. So if you give your fictional people facing discrimination any kind of power, real or imagined, people will use it as a reason that your allegory isn't a good one, because the other people are right to be afraid of them. For example, it's a big one that pops up with like X-Men and that kind of thing. And therein lies a really serious issue, because most people that are facing discrimination I made notes, but I can't read them. Ironically, they're typed notes, but I still can't read them. Because most bigots will present fear as the reason for their bigotry, it is, I mean, think about the fact that we still use the words homophobia and transphobia. 
Like, the word phobia means fear. Like... <laughs> but that's where a lot of people, a lot of people who are trying to destroy a certain group of people will utilise fear as a response and fear as a reasoning and the, the danger of these people that they are <laughs> trying to eradicate, let's be honest, um, as a as a logical reason. And if you've given your allegorical people any kind of power, real or imagined, the they are dangerous concept can just feed more into that bigotry that they are facing. Not all allegories are about bigotry, but a lot of them are. But think about the fact that Think of the Children is a really common one for like anti-trans and anti-LGBT stuff. I'm saying those as two separate things even though they are kind of also the same thing. It's very complicated and I'm not getting into it now. But think of the children, but they never think of the children when they're trying to, you know, solve the foster care crisis. <laughs> That's never brought up as a think of the children. It's only when queer people are involved. Anyway, um, so things like predators eat prey, they should be scared in Zootopia and Zootropolis. Superheroes have power, normal people should be scared in the X-Men. Mages have magic, normal people should be scared as if everyone in Thedas isn't casually carrying a weapon in the Dragon Age universe. It is irritating when people take it too far like that, but it's so often, it happens so often that it's something that you really should be aware of because it will undercut your narrative and your allegory and it makes it really hard to get your message across. I am fully aware of the own, like, it's not to say that you have to change your narrative to allow for that, like, you can do what you want, <laughs> but it's something to be aware of and to potentially try to mitigate if it's something that you think is going to pop up in your narrative, like, I know that because my narrative is about cyborgs, there is a whole conversation about the fact that cyborgs can technically live forever because they are machines. I know that people will probably take it to mean something about AI and electronic learning and all of that kind of stuff instead of what it's actually about. I know that I'm aware of that in advance. I think I've mitigated that to the best of my ability within the narrative and we just have to see how it goes. But. I'm also aware of the fact that if I were trying to go bigger with it, if I had a bigger platform, I'd probably work harder to try and mitigate those concerns now than I actually am going to do because I don't have much of a platform as yet. I'm still building my foundational platform and this is one of my foundational building blocks that I want to use for it and I am happy with the result that I currently have. Waiting on feedback reading as of filming this video, which again, March. Possibly not again. Did I talk about this yet? Yeah. Filming this in March, bringing this out June? <laughs> May? June? Somewhere around then? Hopefully, if the book is ready to go. Number three is hurting the people that you're trying to help, if you are trying to help people via your allegorical narrative, because I know I use Animal Farm, but that is a very specific example, and most of the allegorical narratives are more particularly about people facing bigotry and marginalisation. So hurting those people that you're trying to help by divorcing your world and characters too far from the thing you're trying to make an allegory for, by trivialising their issues. Yeah, the idea that I would enter a bathroom for any other reason than to use the facilities is utterly ridiculous, but it doesn't change the fact that I get scared every time I have to use a public bathroom because I have, in fact, been hassled in bathrooms more than once. The bathroom issue is real for trans people. It's really scary to have to use a public bathroom. And that's really fucking sad. Like, think about that for a minute. Why do you not go out the house much, Will? Why do you not get out much, Will? Yeah, okay, you've said it's the dog. Yeah, okay, you've said it's the pandemic. But, is it actually because if you go out for a whole day, at some point you're gonna have to use a bathroom, and if you have to use a bathroom in a public space, it's gonna likely be a gendered bathroom, and there's a fear in going into any gendered bathroom because you are non-binary and you dress to be visibly non-binary because you want half a chance of people gendering you correctly, but that also actually means that people misgender you more often. Is that a concern of yours, Mill? Yeah, just a bit. Or hurting the people, that's number five now, yeah. Or by hurting, you're going to hurt the people that you're trying to help by going too hard. 
transposing the exact bigotry people are facing into your fantasy setting exactly as it happens in real life, not naming any uh, Netflix based Netflix series based on novels that uh, fellow author Chuba Shiran Jishal has made a very informative video on, which I'll try and remember to link below, but feel free to look at their platform. They do use they them pronouns. Um, <laughs> uh, but that is a thing that that can be... It, if, when you do that, it becomes less of an allegory and more just a straightforward narrative. And the thing about allegorical narratives is they can go anywhere from we fix bigotry all the way to this is a thing that exists in the world that I made up and that can be really tough to balance because you don't want to go too soft and not make the issue clear enough but you also don't want to go too hard and kind of shove in people's faces the, the exact issues that they have to face day to day like to use the bathroom issue once again I don't really want to see an allegorical narrative about <laughs> but who is and is not allowed to use bathrooms like I don't I don't want to see that that's just the reality of my day-to-day -day life I'd rather see something else I'd rather engage with a different kind of allegorical narrative even if it's like oh you're a insert metaphor here you can't go into insert space here it doesn't have to be a bathroom it could be anything oh you are a trans person therefore you must go to the cutting floor not to the wearing floor you know like that's the option oh you you're a non-binary person or the allegory hey you you're allegory for non-binary person which means you are outside these two specific boxes that we like which means you cannot go through either of these doors to ascend and send to the next level of society you must stay in child zone forever that would be an interesting allegory. It's an allegory for the bathroom issue without actually talking about bathrooms. Like, do you see how I'm, do you see what I mean? Do you see how that's sort of like supposed to work? And if you read enough allegorical narratives, again, like utilize the ones I've talked about, I guess, but <laughs> feel free again to share any allegorical narratives you have in the description because in the description in the comments because it is really useful if you want to write an allegorical narrative to get familiar with them like they say what write what you know but it also means write what you've researched write what you know a lot about and if you've read a lot of fantasy you're going to write good fantasy probably but if you've not read a lot of fantasy it's going to be harder to sort of fix yourself into those fantasy tropes that are expected and it's the same with allegorical narratives if you're not familiar with a lot of allegory based narratives you are going to struggle to manage your allegory and that's something that I have actually been dealing with quite a lot with this cyborg novel that I've written that I don't have yet because it's with feedback readers in March um, and one of the issues that I faced a lot with that was that when I first started writing it in 2018 the same time that I started writing 20, 2018, that's right, when I started writing this, please note this is the accidental giant copy that I first ordered before I fixed the sizing. <laughs> um, yeah, when I first started writing this book, well first started, when I first started properly finishing this book based on the terrible, gloriously terrible teenage version that I had, that's when I started writing this cyborg book. It's taken me five years not non-stop obviously i have also written other books in that time including finishing up mary allen breaking the curse and uh, also mary allen finding the air and also uh, another sci-fi novel that is also out with feedback readers a uh, pirate novel that i haven't finished yet um actually three pirate novels i haven't finished yet and starting several other novels including a fake court novel and a vampire hunter novel and <laughs> oh what else many other things um so like it's not like this took me five years this is like this took me five years I found other things but part of the reason that it took me so long is I kept getting to a certain point of it as I've talked about in my how many works in progress is too many video um I kept getting to certain points with it and then getting kind of stuck and then having to put it down and put it away for a while and come back to it. And I will talk about, closer to publication, I will talk about 
how I, hopefully I'll remember to talk about how I got from initial concept all the way through to allegorical novel, but for now, it's taken me five years to write this because I needed to get more familiar with allegorical narratives. The only one, well to be fair, like I was familiar with all of these three that I've used as examples, Animal Farm, albeit in play less than in text because the text is quite dense for me and my dyslexia, but also <laughs> allegorical narrative um, in X-Men. Obviously I grew up with those movies, but I have seen it in a different light now that I'm an adult and out. <laughs> mm. And obviously Zootopia Zootropolis came out, I mean it's a fair few years ago now, but like was less than it was less years ago when I started. It was five less years when I started this project. So conclusions. <laughs> Allegorical narratives can be interesting. They can introduce people to ideas that they wouldn't necessarily notice in real life or things they might specifically avoid in real life because they don't want to notice them. But they aren't perfect and there are some common pitfalls that you want to be at least aware of so that you can potentially mitigate or even avoid altogether. If you're gonna write about something, it's just be careful with it. Like if you aren't part of the group it's going to be that you're writing about it's going to be much harder for you to get the allegory just right because there's nuances to marginalizations that you won't necessarily notice unless you're actively a part of that group no matter how close you are to people in that group if unless you're actively a part of it it is very very difficult to see the nuance and transpose that into a different setting it's not impossible you absolutely can and i highly recommend that for example, straight and cis authors write LGBT narratives, just not coming out stories, just, you know, narratives with LGBT characters in them. Um, but when you're writing about something as tricky as stuff that needs to be made into an allegory, it can be very, very difficult to get that right, especially if you're not super intimately familiar with the thing you're making an allegory about. Which is to say basically that I as a trans person can write a trans allegorical narrative relatively easily because I am trans. My wife would have a much harder time because she is not trans so even though she lives with me and you know spends all of her time with me that isn't at work and <laughs> we talk about everything and she's seen all of this stuff it is different from the outside than it is from the inside. I am not on the side of you have to be out and you have to be part of the marginalisation to do the thing. You can absolutely do the thing and just be aware that the nuance is hard to catch. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, that took a long time to get out. Um, <laughs> so if the book is out, here is where I'll pop up and talk about it. Hey, it's me again. Don't forget, this is a thing that exists. It's coming out on the 27th of June. I don't think I mentioned that, but I should have, because it is. 27th of June is when this should be available, barring any giant horrible disasters that happen in the publishing process, which is a thing that happens sometimes. And if you're looking at this thinking, uh, Will, are they going to all be that battered? No. Uh, my wife took this with her to work for a week, so... Yeah. <laughs> also, Porthos really likes it. I don't know why. He just does. If you like this video, think about giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. I haven't done that in a while, what the fuck? <laughs> if this video is with, no, nah, fuck. I hope you found this at least entertaining, if not helpful. Uh, all the links for where to find me, my books, etc. and my coffee account, if you feel that's part of the channel, are in the description box below, right next to like and subscribe buttons if you feel like sticking around. I will see you in two weeks time, probably, I don't know what's happening because this is going to be posted sometime seriously in the future uh and bye why can i only ever find a giant one when i need it i'll put it in the kitchen that's why come on there's gotta be another one somewhere around here we've got like a thousand copies that's not true all right we'll just use the giant one See, he just, do you mind? <laughs>